Hi, I'm Josh, and welcome to my last monthly wrap-up of 2020. Ooh, it's finally over. Are you uh, happy now? Am I happy now? I'm very tired while I filmed this. I waited until after New Year's and I was up very late. And of course I blame Ashley and the others from her New Year's Eve live for keeping me up. And then of course I did stay up later to, to watch the new Sabrina. But we're here now and you have to deal with, with this. I shower and hopefully I sound awake because I'm trying my best people. I am trying my best. But this month I read a total of 12 books. I don't know if that's the least amount of books I read. It doesn't really matter to me. What does more matter is the number of pages. I think I read 4,600 pages. I'm not sure. It was the least I've read all year. And it's interesting because I've intentionally been framing my TBR since October to be 15 books or 5,500 pages max for my like number of planned books to read. And ever since I've done that, my reading has gotten progressively worse. And I don't know if it's just that I've gotten more comfortable with, you know, reading less, which is fine. I mean, I'm reading plenty already, honestly. Or is the fact that I lowered my limit what I let myself plan to read, making me read less. I guess that's a good thing. That's what I wanted, right? It's what I wanted. But still, I hate not making my goals because I didn't read everything I wanted to this month, but I still had a pretty good reading month. So let's get at it. The first book I read in December, this took a while. Actually, a lot of my books were long. East of Eden by just John Steinbeck. And this, this beautiful piece of work. Oh God, it was so good. This was five stars, first off. I, I It's been like a month since I read this now, but I, was so hesitant, but also so excited to be reading this because I loved Of Mice and Men, but it's about the only Sean Steinbeck I've ever read, which I read it back in high school like a decade ago. Now, more than a decade, because now it's 2021, bitches. And this was, so oh God, it was so good. The writing was, was fun and easy to follow. The characters were, were compelling. The way he developed the story was just so compelling. I'm, I wasn't sure what to expect because it was so long, but we follow these different, this sort of family where some people are portrayed as sort of angelic or good. Others are portrayed as bad or evil. And it was this conversation of morality and right and wrong. And ultimately, I think it does a really good job of sort of showing the flaws in both people and the limitations of people who try and be this perfect individual or the people who are just purely evil or seem to be doing evil things. And it's this interesting conversation of what makes a bad person. And it was also just this really compelling writing. It was so good. Really good. East of Eden. Yes, please. I highly recommend this book. From what I've seen now, though, it seems to be the most popular book, the most highly praised book of John Steinbeck. So that's a, a sad outlook for the future for me when it comes to reading more John Steinbeck. Still a fantastic start. We jump between several different characters throughout the entire novel, but they're all interconnected in a way that I think works really well. But essential characters I think would be these two brothers and maybe their kids. See, that's the problem. We don't even fixate just on them the entire story. But like, they're basically the, the embodiment of Cain and Abel. But it's much bigger than that too. It was like this one other woman who is portrayed as sort of evil and heartless. In fact, there was one flaw in this book, which was the sort of evil um, villain-esque character of this book. She is part of the way Starr Stubbick describes her is her ability to use her sexuality to manipulate people, which don't be wrong, the thing she does is blatantly wrong. But he talks about her asexuality, her lack of desire to actually have sex with anyone, and he uses that as sort of the introduction of this conversation of her lacking feeling. And I feel like it was a little, um, I feel like he he missed the ball there. I don't think he was in, trying to insinuate that being asexual makes you anti-emotional, but the way he described it almost implied that when he was trying to describe the fact that she just lacked emotion and that she liked that sort of part of her brain that would her feel, which obviously you can be asexual and still be able to feel. But still, I still feel like it was a fantastic book. I think we're off to a good start. Next, part of the reason I didn't read all the books I wanted to was because at some point in the month, I realized, Josh, you have to finish your backlist or your ongoing currently reading books that you haven't finished this year, otherwise you never will. So I did it. I made myself finish this piece of shit book, The End of Time by Julian Barber. I was so excited for this. Go back. You can check the receipts. I was so excited for this shit. I was so sure it would be amazing. And I did not like this at all. And what I don't get is when I looked at the reviews, there's 
there's some pretty good reviews. People seem to think this was good writing. That it was, it was like really fascinating, which don't get me wrong, the topic's fascinating, but they, they seem to think that he did a good job explaining it. I don't think he did at all. I have a vlog where I talk about this in depth. I advise you go there. It's my space time reading vlog. But to finalize what this is about and my final thoughts about this is that it's supposed to be this nonfiction science book about the nature of time. And basically it's trying to say that time doesn't exist. I feel like he's saying shit that we already know. Maybe this, he was the first one to say it. I don't think so. The basic idea is the past, the present, the future. We imagine them as distinctly different, but in reality, physics seems to imply, seems to suggest that each moment in time already exists within the span of space-time. And this idea that the now being unique is just how, an illusion of how our mind interprets reality. Think of it as sort of, if I have a line in space, my hand is here, and then here, and then here. Just because my hand is moved doesn't mean these points in space don't exist anymore. They're still there. So you can think of us existing at any point in space-time or any point in time as also being the same way. Well, these points in time exist in space-time. Therefore, that point in space-time still exists, even though our current perspective does not make us privy to that. And it, I think it's really interesting, that basic idea, but I think this book does a shit job of explaining it. And I feel like there's supposed to be more to it, because I feel like he was trying to apply this more there, and I don't think he made it very effective. I won't lie, I made about 30 or 40% 40, 40 in this book before I decided, you know what, Josh, you're going to scammer you the rest of this shit. I put on my, my Kindle, I did e-text reader, and I just let myself listen to like it's a regular audiobook, and it's not. I, the reason it took me so long was I tried slow reading it, that didn't work, and then I tried listening while reading slowly, and eventually I ran out of time, I ran out of patience, but I did want to finish it because I wanted to try and get a hint of what he's trying to say, and ultimately it fell flat. I almost DNF'd it, but I, I wanted to finish it because I, I wanted to at least try. And I ended up giving this, I want to say it was two, maybe two and a half stars, but it just didn't work for me. I felt like the way he wrote was terrible, his point was not clear, and that, that really undermines the book for me. The way he introduced the concept from the very start was so convoluted. He did not do what I think needs to be done when you're talking about science books. You have to introduce your idea in a base level and then begin to frame an argument as to why we should care or why we think this is the way it is. But instead, it was as if he was walking around the point he was trying to make. I don't know, I'm not really explaining it very well. You know, I just watched my vlog. I'm being as shit as this book was. I just want to clarify, I was really invested in this book and it just didn't work for me. It made me really mad. That's why I keep calling it shit. There are plenty of people who love this book. I don't think it is objectively shit. I mean, I don't think it's a well-written book, but there are a lot of people who disagree and I am hardly and I'll be all when it comes to reviewing science books, let's be clear there. Clearly, I gave up pretty early on the book and decided just to sort of skim read through it. So like everything I said here with a grain of salt, I was just very salty with how excited I was and how disappointed it ended up making me. Another book that I finished, another arc, was From Slave Cabins to the White House. I want to say I gave this three and a half out of five stars. It's not a bad book, it's really interesting, but I found the writing not easy to follow. Other people did. I advise you check it out on Goodreads because I do think it has some interesting stuff to say. It's basically talking about the way black people, particularly black women, have made a place for themselves in a society that doesn't want them or has at least acted like they don't want them and actively try to push them out. And the way society has reacted as women and other black people have tried to make a place for themselves. It works largely as a work of literary criticism or critique by basically studying society and society's reactions to these sort of roles uh, of black women and black people by studying literary works in the past. And that was interesting, but as someone who wasn't familiar with a lot of those works, I found it hard for me to stay focused and really follow along with the points. There are some points where I was able to follow, where she talked about things like Beloved or Kindred by Octavia Butler. When we got to those points, it was a really fascinating conversation because it was something that I could sort of have some grounding to, some perspective to really appreciate what she was trying to say. So I don't think it's a bad book. I advise, if you think it's an interesting concept, to check it out on Goodreads and ask yourself if you think it's something worth pursuing. I got an arc for this. I think it was published in October, August 31st, 2020. All in all, not a bad book. It just didn't work for me as well as I would have liked it to. Next, I read Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. This is a set of essays, I think, compiled after her death. Some of them were actually speeches or interviews she had with other people post-death. And I read this because uh, the Black Future Book Club is going to be doing a book club discussion about this, I assume in January at this point. 
I think I gave it four, maybe four and a half stars. I want to say four. Again, check Goodreads for final numbers there. But all in all, I thought it was a really interesting conversation. Um, there were some really thought-provoking essays in here talking about race, gender, and sexuality, and about what it was like to be a lesbian mother with a black son. I guess ultimately the reason I did not give it a high rating was just because... Oh, why? I said I don't really have a good reason. This is an example of a time where I'm not sure why I don't think it was a five star. I just didn't uh, feel like it, it reached that point for me. I guess maybe it's just that it felt kind of disjointed because of the fact that it was collected after her death. It's interesting to have all these ideas, these thoughts, coalesced into one place, even if they don't necessarily all flow together, but they do sort of still fit this larger theme of race, society, and gender. This was my anti-racist book of December too, as well. Also, this cover, I think I got it from Book Depository. It is gorgeous. It's Penguin. Penguin nonfiction, modern classics. Now, this is not in order, but I want to go ahead and move on to the final book that I read in December, which is actually something I started in late November, so I, I took my time with this one, but The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. I read the entire collection, and before you say, Josh, did you really read all seven books in one month? Are you serious? Like, yeah, it's like 800 pages, so this was actually fairly short relative to some other books. Moderate, rather. I'm gonna give this three stars. This had its ups and downs. I feel like his writing got better with time. But there was also like an increase in racism, especially in the last book. Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophe, I think, has a, has a review of The Final Battle, which I would refer you to for an All Voices review of that. But essentially, we have a character, the villain of the last book being an ape, and phrases used that were blatantly racist or, or used to refer um, to black people in a derogatory way. And they could really undermine the seventh book. There were like seven different narrators for every book and they were all great. The best of which was Patrick Stewart reviewing the last book. And it, it's sad that he <laughs> had to be the one reviewing the shittiest book, or the most racist book in my mind, the most blatantly racist at least. This did get very preachy, especially the end. If you've ever read this, the ending, I do not find that heartwarming at all. It was dark as fuck. To me, it's representative of a bigger problem in the logic or the way of thinking of Christianity. The ending of this book was something that sort of reflects some, I, I don't want to say you get the wrong impression, but some, some feelings or some questions I had as a child as to why we do certain things in life if this is the ultimate goal. And I do think it's just it's, it's just a bad way of approaching this book, the bad way of approaching the ending. I did not find it happy as someone who is not a Christian. I found it dark and, and just creepy. And almost like... <laughs> Damn it, I can't, I can't spoil it. I want to talk about it more, but I'm not going to. I would say that in early books, like the second book, I liked, but it's also undermined by the writing is not being as good, in my opinion. And it was also an overarching problem in this book of there being no real threat. Even if the story feels pretty fun and pretty exciting, there never is any emotional payoff in a satisfactory way, in my opinion. It's just, let's all make everything great. Even the first one, which I, I really like, it's like a full-on poodle fantasy, which is the magician's nephew. We have the magician who is a bad guy who sides with evil. And when things end, I mean, this is minor spoilers here, but I mean, it's super old. So just let me make my point, I guess, is that he sort of just ends okay. It's like he gets over his bad decisions and he becomes basically a good person. Like, where the fuck is the payoff? He made objectively bad choices. He needs to punish. Like, isn't the whole idea of hell? And it's just, instead he's like, oh, everything turns out great. He realizes his, his wrong and now he's a good person. While well, the White Witch is just evil and will always be evil and there's no saving her. Because of course she is the embodiment of Satan. And it, it's just, I don't like the logic. And the question of creativity here. I don't know. It doesn't, like there are parts of it that I recognize are just objectively creative, but also like the overarching storylines here, or especially the second book, are just a rip off of Christianity. It's like, it's like, let me take this and just change the characters into animals and blah, blah, blah. Especially the first book, the part about creation. It was like very preachy, very just Genesis. I almost DNF this, I will say, but I, it got like 60 or 70% and I realized, you know what, Josh, finish this damn chunker, because you're almost there. You wouldn't waste an entire month on it. And it's just really disappointing because I thought this would be, even if something I, I had problems with, I thought it would be fun and easy to read. And while it was easy to read, I didn't find it to be that fun, honestly. It just it was, it was dull. It felt like a chore. I thought it would be, at the very least, just a fun read. Now, moving on to the real chunkers 
of this. This is the first half or the second half of The Way of Kings, but I read The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson this month, and that was like 1,200 to 1,100 pages. And so this was the real chunker. This took me over a week to read, but I ended up giving this four stars. I talk about this in my most disappointed reads of 2020, but I want to be clear, I really like this book. I liked how everything paid off in the direction the story is going. And ultimately, before I pick up book two, I want to reread this so I can really appreciate it. But the way the story is told, it's like a lot of war building and we have jumping from a lot of characters, especially at the beginning and when in the, in the interludes. And I had trouble connecting and catching all the details early on. And I was panicking, worrying that I wasn't gonna like this, that I was going to have to DNF it. And that I wasn't gonna go with the series because I thought this would be a series I could really get into. And ultimately I did get into it, but it took, was a lot harder for me than I would have liked. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem with the book. I think it's a problem of just how I read and what this book requires of a reader, I suppose. So I imagine it will probably get a higher rating in a reread uh, when I have that appreciation for it. That said, I still have some critiques, which is that I don't know if we need all these interludes. He's giving us novellas anyway, so why can't some of these interludes of the larger Cosmere or Stormlight Archive world be in a novella as well? It just seems unnecessary to make this book so long with so many extraneous details. That's just my thoughts. Another book that I want to say I gave four, maybe four and a half stars that I enjoyed more. I think it was four and a half. The Final Empire, book one of the Mistborn series. This was definitely easier to read. And I'll also say that I read this one after Stormlight Archetype. That was obviously a mistake. I did not know what I was getting into. And this would have been a better entry into sort of large scale fantasy while also sort of <laughs> slowly working my way to this sort of epic world building that we have in A Way of Kings and Stormlight Archive. But this one I really enjoyed. I don't think it was five star material. I don't know. It just it did still feel sort of formulaic, even though there were some there were surprises in here and it was a solid world building solid solid characters and a cool magic system part of me is, is curious to learn more about it like i still like there's still more to understand when it comes to the sort of mass balance force balance of the way they use these metals to sort of push and pull and the way force is distributed on certain people or objects and how that works when it comes to you know physics but <laughs> what it say to away from the story majorly just an interesting idea that i would love to read more about or understand have a conversation about with people solid book i read this for a vlog that has not gone up yet but it will hopefully go up sometime in january in that same vlog another another fantasy here the last wish by Andrzej Saposkiewicz i should really prep for these videos shouldn't i after a year i should know this by now but i'm a failure um this one is a series of short stories that are supposed to work as an introduction to the witcher i thought it was good it was fun i thought it was more fairy tale like than Brandon Sanderson and it was easy to get into to Brandon Sanderson. That said, I don't understand what this people think this is a good intro to the Witcher series because I found it to be sort of disjointed. Like sure it was connected in some ways, but ultimately I felt like we can say we were just getting an appreciation for the world more so than a real formal introduction to our characters. Four stars is what I gave this. Next, I reread Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. In this one, I actually sort of read twice in a sense that I listened to an abridged audio edition by Patrick Stewart and then I read full edition or narrated by Scott Brick. Both are really good. I've said my thoughts about this before. It's just five stars. I love the gothic time travel story of it all. And I, I think it's really well, good storytelling mixed with satisfying character payoff. And as for my narr the narrators, I would say Patrick Stewart's better than Scott Brick and Scott Brick isn't as good as Frank Muller. I talk about this book more and my thoughts about it more in the Christmas wrap up, which on that note, I also sort of listened to How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I, I think I gave that four stars. <laughs> yeah, four stars. It was fine. Lastly, another vlog that has not been posted yet, they're both sort of ongoing, is which is first reading Nato Hopkinson's Falling in Love with Hominids. This this book is really why this vlog that I was vlogging for it is taking so long because I was trying to slowly read this and sort of appreciate every story. I even went through and basically made notes of my thoughts at the end of each story to better appreciate it. And ultimately I gave this four stars because that's what the average rating was. This is sort of a sci-fi fantasy me mesh of short stories. And all in all, I think this speaks to a really creative mind and a great world builder. But there were too many stories in here that I felt like were more interested in creating a world than doing anything with it. It's sort of, we had this really interesting idea and nothing happens with it. That said, when she does do something with it, I found there were some really really great stories in here. None of them were objectively bad. There was, I think, one or two that I thought was meh, but all of them were at least intriguing, if not, you know, exceptional. So solid, solid collection, an interesting start 
to Naylor Hopkinson. It makes me really excited to dig into her full-length novels. And lastly, the last book, not really, no idea what the last book, but the second last book that I read was Two Moons, Stories by Crystal A. Smith. And I can't wait till you watch the vlog for this because the vlog really encapsulates my feelings when I read this. Well, this book will probably be in my best of the year because it was so good. This is black girl magic, uh, queer, lesbian short stories that were fundamentally fantastical and mythological. These stories were so heartwarming. This was literally the closest to perfection I've ever seen in a short story collection. There was one story that I wouldn't give a full five stars. The rest of them, all the way. And even then, it was, I wonder if maybe it was just an appreciative thing about the story. Part of me wants to reread it. I definitely want to reread the entire short story collection, but needless to say, this whole thing at five stars. This oh, was a book I read at the recommendation of in Jerry from Onyx Pages. I think it was in a top. 10 or top 20 of, I want to say 2018 or 2019. And oh my God, it was it was just so good. I did not expect to love this as much as I did. We basically had this mesh of sort of this heartwarming emotional connection or message to each story mixed with these really interesting, fantastical mythological worlds where they're just very subtle. And when I say subtle, some of them are subtle, some of them are pretty overt. But what I like about them is that as someone who's a naturalist, like I, when I think about what a world should be like, if there are really this mythological side to it, I feel like it should be this sort of absurdist, nonsensical world where things, things are completely different than they actually seem. And I think this really embodies that in a way that really worked for me. That was not only just just so much fun and so interesting to read about. They weren't just that, but they were emotionally satisfying by having an underlying emotional connection that I could connect to. I, I really loved it because a big part of this is a, a story about love and like the central story here, Two Moons, is about the love between a young black girl and the moon and their connection. And it was just so powerful, so beautiful. Like, I'm usually the kind of person who loves dark stories, but this collection, while there are dark aspects to it, it was fundamentally hopeful and positive and when I think about a feel-good book, this would be the one that I go to. It was so good. I, nobody's read it. Like, it's like 97 reviews or ratings on Goodreads. Please consider picking this up. This is short, but such a powerful, powerful collection. And I can't wait to talk about it in my top books of 2020. It was also a fantastic way of ending the year. But those are the books that I read in, in 2020. No, no, they're not. Those are the books that I read in December of 2020. This is my last wrap-up of 2020 obviously. And let me know what you read this month. How was it as a reading month for you? Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll see y'all next time. I'll be for my quarterly stat review. But as always, I hope you all have a great day and stay safe. Goodbye.